Go. Uh oh. Go. Access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker or registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed attract and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither philstockworld.com, PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of the respective officers. Personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar, website, or promotional material constitutes a promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involves risk. Visit the OCC website www.optionsclearing.com to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides education and training services that are meant to teach you to the risks and potential rewards of trading options, and we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying or guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on that specific or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any loss you may incur as a result of information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured. We take your privacy very seriously and we will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. Okay. Fantastic. That was exciting. All right. Let's see. What is going on around here? Let's go take a look at the markets. Whoa. Look at the NASDAQ fly. Holy crap. I knew it was going to catch up. And how's the Dow doing? Very nice. Huh. Well, that's a shame. I thought it's a shame it went so high already. Early this morning, we had fun in the uh, in chat room. We we made it. In fact, on this on here's a couple in this one. This account has a few trades. Um, we got uh, a five hundred dollar hit here and one hundred and eighty five there and seven eighty five there. So you know, it's like uh, I don't know, twelve, thirteen uh, thousand to about fourteen hundred dollars roughly. You know, nice little moves up that we caught and. Um, what happened is first thing in the morning in the chat room, where's our chat room? So <clears throat> at the time I was writing this, the market was down tremendously. It dropped 300 points when the uh, thing came out. And um, we talked about the weakened strong bounce lines. And when we got down to this weak bounce line, especially 1480 on the S&P, this is a key. So, so here's your lines. Uh, I wish I could show these both at the same time. Um, I guess if I make that smaller and uh, no, that's too much bother. Okay. Um, I know what I can do. Though. I can put it up on my other screen then I can read it at least. Hang on a second. So copy those or memorize them or whatever so you have it. But it'll, now we're going to go look at the charts. So those are our lines. And here's what was actually happening. So... We know these lines. These lines are what we calculated. You know, this, these are our 5% rule lines. We calculated these. So, we, you know, that's already done. We've had this, you know, these are right, right in front of us all the time. <clears throat> so, the thing starts dropping, and this is the, um, the Dow. And we know the line on the Dow for the week bounce is 24,100, way down here. The line on the S&P for a week bounce is 2610 which is way down here. Notice how the Dow and the S&P are basically in lockstep. Um, on the NASDAQ, the, these are the weak bounce lines. The weak bounce line is 6440, which is right here. So we almost got to it on the, on the NASDAQ. Where did we hit it, though? On the Russell, the bounce line is, is 1480. So as we went down below the, bounce, the weak bounce line on the Russell, but the other ones held up. Okay, and notice how it dropped off a little earlier than the other guys, right? This is um, uh, 8.15, 8.25. This is 8.25. So every while, well, so, okay. So everybody bought it at like 8.25. 8.30, yeah, okay, sorry. My apologies. It's not, it's not different. So everybody bought it at 8.25. And as I'm writing it, I'm saying, well, you know what? If we're coming back to 14.80 really quick, which we did, we spiked right back to 14.80, Nobody else broke below their bounce line. So I said, you know what? 
since the Russell is the lowest, it's on its weak bounce lines. Forget this chart, forget what you see here. We know on the 5% rule that that 1480 line is significant for the Russell. You can see how it consolidated around it. So we, we knew that was going to be, and even though it's not the pivot points, see, you know, these guys consolidated on their pivot points. He consolidated on his weak bounce line on the, on the, um, on the big chart, on the 5% rule of these. So that became the obvious one to play. As soon as everybody started breaking over their levels, I made a call to play the Russell Long. So I said, we need to see strong bounces, blah, blah, blah. Okay, strong inflation numbers. Oh, strong inflation numbers are killing. Oh, okay. Also, by the way, you don't mess around. You don't do this because of purely technical reasons. The reason we play this is because we know, I see fundamentally, why are we dropping? First thing that happens when there's a drop, I don't go looking to make a play. I say, why are we dropping? And in this case, it was very obvious we were dropping because we had a very strong CPI report. But a lot of the strength comes from oil, which when shooting up, you know, oil and gasoline went very far up, so that caused a lot of the gains. That So that's a theoretically temporary. It also doesn't affect the core CPI, so it has nothing. So the Fed could care less about what happens to oil and gas. They don't count food and energy. So it wasn't a great reason for the market to correct. Also, why does the market go down when there's strong inflation? Because the Fed tries to keep inflation under control, and therefore you say that, well, the Fed will start tightening. They're already tightening. They already anticipated inflation going higher, and they started a program to tighten and, and reduce QE. They're already doing that. They know they were going to overshoot the market a little bit on inflation. Plus, there's only seven meetings left. So only seven. So there's seven meetings left this year, and they're already planning to tighten in four of them. They're not going to tighten five out of seven meetings. They're not going to tighten every single meeting except for two. That would be much. That would probably also that would probably really freak the markets out. So it's incredibly unlikely that the number that we saw this morning was going to change anything, which means that a 300-point drop in the Dow is kind of an overreaction. So based on that, we decided to play it, to play it long. Um, anyway, so I mentioned that that you know it's, uh, the hedges are very important and so on and so forth. Where where was it though? Somewhere around here, I started talking about TF. Oh, yeah, down here. So it was by 845, this is when the Russell came back. I said, we're back at these numbers. And since 1480 is the weak bounce line on the Russell, the others are still the weak bounce lines. We're going to watch that and play TF long above the line as long as the other index is making progress. The sell-off is probably overdone, blah, blah, blah. Now, so during chat, we flip-flopped around on a couple of different ones as it went up. But they all made very nice money. But the point is, from 1480 to, um, I mean, geez, this is 100, uh, not 100, sorry, $50 per point. So that's 20 points here is 1000 bucks. All right? And that's another 10 points is, is $1,500 per contract on the longs on this thing. I, I On this one, I got out when there was only $500. Bucks. Um, you know, if you know your lines, you can make really good money playing this stuff. All right, so now we're now we're testing the strong bounces, and the strong bounces are so now relevant to to you making money right this minute. The strong bounce lines are twenty four thousand seven hundred. We popped over the strong bounce on um, the S and P. The strong bounce is twenty six seventy. We popped over the strong bounce on um, the Russell. The strong bounce is fifteen ten. We're right at the strong bounce line on the Russell, and the Nasdaq is uh well we blew past it on the nasdaq the nasdaq is 65.80 and we're we're a mile over that on the nasdaq so if anything at the moment you would the russell is is lagging now and you would play the and you can play the russell bullish above the 1510 line as long as 1510 holds it's probably going to go another 10 points higher from here so that's the long i would take at the moment but only if, obviously, all these guys hold. So you mark down where you are. You say, okay, I'm at this level and this level and this level. And as long as they hold, especially the S&P on that red line, as long as those lines hold, then I don't mind being bullish on the Russell. All right. Now, frankly, on my, on my main account, I, I, I took the money and ran on all this shit because this is like, like a lot of gains for one day. All right. Let's see if we have any questions. 
Dun, dun, dun. Okay, any thoughts on the SQQ bull call spread added Friday? Well, well, it, I'm glad we added it, but um, it's certainly no longer. I mean, it's not. It was doing well for a minute, and now it's not doing. But we didn't, you know, we didn't add the spread for one day. It's a spread to protect our longs from suffering damage. Oh, I'm sorry. And also, by the way, I'm, I think we added that to the short-term portfolio. Is that correct? Um, in the short-term portfolio. We had shifted incredibly bullish, which thank goodness we did, because we um, we we bought we sold our we sold our long puts on our hedges, and so that those that extra hedge we put on the SQQ was to protect us against a disaster because the market had tanked and gone the other way today, like it was starting to. It would have really hurt the short puts, um, the, the short positions that we didn't sell. Because we took the profit on the, on the downturn and we expected a big bounce and we're getting a big bounce now. So, um, and now we have to start looking at it again to say, what are we going to do about covering? But that, that hedge, I'm not letting go of. I think it's January too. Um, okay. We can hear you. We can see it. Yes, screen. Can you see the screen? Okay. Uh, I don't hear anything. Oh, Russell, oh, Russell said he didn't hear anything, but then it says he left. Sorry, I don't know what went wrong. Um, Phil, would like your insight on adjusting or leaving alone the CMG position 250, 280 bull call spread with a short put. Oh, we just did that today, didn't we? Um, all right. Um, so Brendan's got the bull, the CMG 250, 280. See, the time to adjust it was um, the time to adjust it was when it was down. You know, now you're having didn't do anything remorse. Uh, it's going to be very hard to adjust that spread because, uh, you know, now it's gotten away from you, right? Because uh, CMG is at what? Um, well, let's see. CMG. They're testing 290. See, what we did when it was down, well, I wrote about it on the Morning Post. Um, where is that? See, we had, what do we have? I forgot. We have the two, we have the 273 10 spread. And the uh I'm sorry, we had yeah, sorry, 280. We have the 283 10 spread and we sold the 270 puts. Then when it dropped on us, so we did that. That was that first trade that we made on January 2nd. So basically right there, and we felt really smart because CMG started taking off, and we're like, oh, this is gonna be great. <laughs> and then it went the other way, and we were like, ah. <laughs> so, but but that's the thing, though. We didn't go, ah, we don't freak out, because when we bought it here, we knew very well that we expected it to go up 10%. Well, it certainly can go down 10% just as easily, and it did. It went up at 10% and down 10% that time, or 15%, really. Um. Oh, oh, good, Russell. Okay, good. Uh, let's see. So, um. Anyway, so what we did is we know there's a range. We came in on it. And the reason, by the way, hmm, how would you know this? You wouldn't. The reason I know, we came in at 270, I'm sorry, we came in 283.10. And so I know from that that I wasn't being very aggressive. It was a tight range. We took the spread for only um, $14 on a $30 spread. And it was a small amount, only five short puts and 10 long. So I intended to adjust that spread. I, but I, I, was, I was hoping CMG would go lower. When we, when we bought it, it was already testing $300. Um, I was hoping we'd catch a lower drift. So I expected it to either go up or down. Now, if it went up, we'd be fine because we were in the money. We would have made our whatever we planned to make. We were going to make $33,000. But it went up first so i was like okay i mean look it goes up like that you say oh well we made thirty three thousand dollars. what can you do when it goes down that's the exciting part because then it's like oh boy now we get to make it a bigger spread because we know we're getting a bargain so when it came down to 250 on february 7th and this is from the uh, phil stock world chat room i said we have cmg in the long-term portfolio i like the trade um and I said, good thing. Now, this is only a discussion. We weren't making a trade here. I said, good thing we sold the short call. That kept us out of trouble. It's too early to pull the trigger. 
but the three tens, this is on um, the seventh, that was like last Wednesday. So, but the three tens will buy him back week four bounce and um, sell something else. So I'm just, I'm just giving the basic plan of what we want to do. Eat, if we do that every few months, we'll pick up 20,000 a year, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> so, I'm talking about how doing it and what the plan is and how the strategy goes. Then the next day, I decided after watching it for, for a day, which is probably maybe here, I wasn't right, it still went down lower, but the next day I said, oh, okay, now I'm going to put my foot down. I thought about it for a day and I said, you know what, here's what we're going to do. Because the trade at the time was basically even. So, so basically it didn't cost us anything and we're in a position that we could certainly improve. So I said, here you go. We're going to buy back the four short calls at a buck 40 because a buck 40 between now and March, who cares? Um, and I said, not because I think it'll come back, but it clears the short, it clears the slot for a sell on the bounce. Now, meanwhile, it almost, it's almost coming back. So who knows? But I said, not because I think we'll come back, but it clears the slot so that when it bounces, we can sell. So in other words, we don't have these four uh, March calls on our back. Now we have a clear slot to sell into. Now we'll take a proper risk and buy back. So now we're gonna now we're gonna take a risk. Now we're gonna buy back the ten short, uh, three ten calls, which of course we would do if we're rolling it anyway. But we we bought them back without um, selling more calls. That's where we took a risk, and they're up twelve bucks. And I want to lock. So I wanted to lock in the twelve bucks we gained on that, which is twelve thousand dollars. And then I said we can then roll the ten longs, uh, the twenty twenty two eighty calls. To um, to the 2022 60 calls, and we only spent 850 to do that. So for 850, we rolled 20 dollars lower in strike. So if it works out, which it did, we're going to get paid back 20 on our 850 that we spent. And then said, so now CMG goes high, blah blah blah. So now, meanwhile, we got a huge bonus though because now it shot up. We took a chance by being naked long. And now it's shot way up, and now we can sell these calls. It's going to cover the whole cost of the spread. But we decided to do something much more complicated. Um, unfortunately, though, um, Brendan, this doesn't apply to you because you're still stuck with the freaking spread. But what we did is we're, we're now cashing our calls and going for a cheaper spread. Let's take a look at what you have, though. You have the 250-280 spread. I assume that's 20-20. And the short 250 puts. So, um, so you were more conservative with your spread pricing, and you were more conservative with your puts that you sold. Uh, let's see. Okay. So, what was it? 250, 280. So the 250s are now 82 bucks, and nobody nobody's been trading them. The 250s are now 82 bucks, and the um, and the 280s are 67 dollars, I would say. So 82, 67, um, 15. What? That doesn't make any sense. Let me try this again. The 250s are 82 bucks, and the and the 280s. Oh no wonder you're not happy. And the 280s are 67. The 60s 82, 67, 15 bucks. Wow, what a great deal that is as a new spread. I mean that's gonna be, I mean that's gonna make a hundred percent, and all CMG has to do is hold 280. Why? Wow. What do you want to What do you want to trade that in for? Um, you got the 250 short puts. Which are thirty bucks? That's a huge amount of money too. Wow, that's a great spread. So you could buy, you could do that right now as a new spread. You could buy, you could sell five of these and buy ten of those, and your net cost would be zero, and you have a thirty thousand dollars spread. So I don't, you know, I'm not sure what you want to do. I would buy that spread. I wouldn't sell it. Now, if you sold an even amount, if you don't have a two for one on the on the high end. Um, you might want to reconsider that, but the way these things are moving, um, I wouldn't change it. I mean, it's, you know, there's not enough, you don't have any way to change it really, because I would, I sure as hell wouldn't give these guys for the 280 calls. I wouldn't pay them $67. That's that's highway robbery. <laughs> that's just an insane amount of money. 
So what we did is we took a whole new spread. We took the 300, 350 spread because it was cheaper. And uh, we, so we have that spread and then we've got the short puts that we sold anyway. And what we're going to do now is we're going to um, sell calls. In fact, we did, we sold three of the, um, the April 310s or 300s. So 300s we sold and they were like 14 bucks before. So, so we already made money there. But we sold, so we sold three, one third basically of the amount we sold in these uh, Aprils for, and we collected 4,500 bucks. So, um, uh, so, so anyway, if we, if we collect 4,500 bucks 10 times, that's $45,000 against a zero cost long. So, you know, if I'm going to suggest anything, I would suggest, depending on, I don't know how many you have, but we're selling one third of these because we're going to collect as much money here selling every quarter, you know, selling every couple of months to sell, to get a little bit of money. We can collect as much money there on the short, on the short calls as we will collect on the total hedge, on the total spread down the line. Oh, they're 2019s, I think Brendan's saying now. So the 2019s, maybe it's better. We'll see. It's a uh, 250, 280. So here we're looking at 64 and 46. Nope, still sucks. Um, that's what eighteen dollars. No, you st it's still not worth it because it's eighteen bucks, and you're going to make almost a hundred percent. And the 250 shorts are eighteen dollars. So again, like I said, the, if you made a mistake at all, the mistake was not doing two x in the long. Because you don't need to pay zero for the for the spread, but if you did do it that way, if you paid ba if you basically sold the puts for what the spread cost, and you've got no money in it, and you're going to collect you know uh, three thousand dollars per contract on the other side, well, you know what? Why are you worried about? It? <laughs> you're getting three thousand bucks for nothing. So yeah, there's not much to do to adjust it. Um, the, the, if you want to be more bullish and adjust it. The thing I would look to do is roll the um, short calls higher, and let's say the 300s are 36, and yours are 46, so you're going to get two for one rolling them higher. As you, you pay 10 bucks, and you're going to roll them $20 higher. You get into a wider spread. Now, you could use that logic the other way and go from the 250s to the 230s. So we said 64 here, but, here, but that doesn't work because he, these are 77. So it's $13 that way. So it's a lot cheaper to roll the short calls higher. But I would not do that unless you plan on, if you plan on selling some short calls, I'm very in favor of paying 10 bucks to widen the spread. And here's what I mean. Let's say, <clears throat> it hurts me not to say numbers. Let's say you have 10 of these. All right, so you have, so you have, you have a $30,000 spread that looks very good, like high probability of making $30,000. What should you do? Well, first of all, you should make the $30,000 and shut up, right? That's the, the logical thing is say, you know what? $30,000 is a lot of money. I should be happy. I patiently wait two years and I collect my $30,000. If you want to be greedy about it, but you also have to be prepared to work, I would put $10,000 into the roll to push the 280s to the 300s. Now you have a $50,000 spread that you paid $10,000 for. But I know I can get that $10,000 back because now, again, assuming you have 10 contracts, I would then sell three of the April 300s for $11, you know, eleven thirty, whatever, for $11. That's $3,300. So what do you do? You spend $10,000 to widen your spread by $20,000, but now you're going to collect one third of that money back in just a two-month sale, in a 65-day sale. You do that three times and you've paid for the widening of the spread. And now you've got a $50,000 spread instead of a uh, whatever. Now, should CMG keep plowing higher, you have 10 longs that pay $50,000 versus the three short calls. These 300s in April can be rolled in July. And what you do is you just look. Oh, there's no July. I'm sorry. They can be rolled in June to what, well, logically, to whatever is about 11 bucks. So they could be rolled to the June 325. So there you go. In in another 60 days, in, in um, sorry, not another 60 days, 90 more days. In 90 more days, 
No way, that was 60 days, the first one, right? Yeah, sorry. So another, I'm sorry, another 60 days. In another 60 days, they can be rolled $25 higher. So June, July, August, September. So by September, I expect to be able to roll at least to the 350. So that means the September 350 should be at least $11. And where is September? September 350s are way more than $11. So you can pretty much go to the 360s. Yeah, there you go, the 360s. And then in January, what is $11 in January? Uh, these guys are 390s, so or almost a 400. So basically, you don't get in trouble with three short March 300 calls until you hit $400 in January. So as long as Chipotle doesn't shoot up 33% between now and January, you are not going to be in trouble on your on your spread. And don't forget your spread is the 250-300 spread if you widen it. So you'll have $50,000 to pay these guys with whatever they happen to be in the money. Now, that's if you just roll the three contracts. Of course, you could split the contracts and roll them much higher to six contracts. You're still almost double covered and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of moving parts, but I just want you to give you the idea. You have to think like moves in advance and look at the position and say, oh, well, in that case, given that this is such a high rolling ratio that you can do going along, you can feel very comfortable selling three short calls, which is why we do that. We actually did four. Originally, we did four in the uh, portfolio. The reason we did three is because I am a little nervous that a bunch of upgrades are going to come on Chipotle and they'll blast up to three, three, 310 or 320 and mess us up. So, you know, I, so for this particular time right now, I'm being a little bit cautious about what we're selling. We sold three instead of four because I have no trouble at all taking three and splitting into six of the higher strike. But you always got to think about what could happen, what are you going to do if that happens, and are you comfortable with where you're going to be at that time? But so my solution for you in that case is that, you know, that's my, that's what I would do is I would, I would widen my spread by, I would spend the money to widen the spread and then get the money back by selling short calls. All right, so there you go. That's how you make $20,000 more. <laughs> uh, I left it. Okay, I was Russell. Sorry. Phil, in the OOP, I'm assuming that you will alert us as to when we take profits on legs of these spreads. Yes, yes, that is the whole point. <laughs> so yeah, hi Chinese. Yeah, I see, I've seen you in the comment section. Um, yeah, so when, when we when we do, I, I by the way, I try <laughs> the nature of the OOP. It's not like Phil Stock World where I'm live with the members constantly. So you know, in Phil Stock World, when we have to do something. The, the members see this. See that? So here's what you like to. Here, so so at ten o'clock, I said, okay. So our official move for the LTP is we're going to do this. Um, and then later we covered it and so on and so forth. Um, here's a that, that was the oh yeah. And then a minute later, I had a another. I said more to say on the same trade actually. So with Phil Stock World, we have these blue, very obvious things that come up in the chat room, and those are our official moves for our portfolios. Um, and so I'm live constantly talking to the members. That's not how Seeking Alpha is. Also, Seeking Alpha doesn't have people who are there all day long. You know, we're a membership subscription service. People are paying to be here all day long. So this is where they are. With Seeking Alpha, people are God knows where during the day. They sign in, they sign out. So I, I, think I learned from, from doing the first portfolio that we did over there that people are just not up for really fast trading. So mostly I try to trade as little as possible. I don't really make an adjustment unless there has to be an adjustment. I make most, I'll, I'll make new trades on a, you know, whenever I see a new trade that's good for the portfolio, I'll put it in there. But I won't make an adjustment other than maybe I try to keep it down to like once a month that we do adjustments. So basically once a month we do a portfolio review and I'll put up the adjustments I want to make. And in fact, frankly, if you're a member over there, go back and look at what we did last year and you'll see exactly how the process goes. You know, just go through the old, the old uh, articles. <clears throat> uh, Neil says RB is over 170. Oh, ho, 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 ho. You gotta be kidding. That's great, we called that this morning. That was a good one. Um, 
or B. Nice. So I picked up two longs. Um, oh, here you go. We'll show the uh, Tribune chat. Oh, here you go. I wrote right there. RB168 is nice for those of us playing that game. So we we're talking about. Um, oh, wait. That's not where we started. Control F slash RB. Ah, so at 931, I said I added two longs on RB at 166 because the API report was terrible. So there's an API report that comes out on Tuesday night. That report is a, a privately gathered report, not the public EIA official government report. The API report is a, is a private survey and it's not very accurate because what the API report does is they call the uh, warehouse managers who are people who are storing oil and they say to them, so how much oil you got? <laughs> and the guy doesn't go there and run through the warehouse for the API guys and figure it out. Now, of course, they've got computers and they have things, but mostly they're just eyeballing it. You know, they're going to give them a quick answer. They're going to eyeball it. They're not going to wait for the computer to update. The guy calls them on the phone. He's annoying them and asking a survey question every week. Same thing. So. These guys are answering the survey question the way you answer a survey question on the phone. You're like, eh, you know, this or that. You know, you, you don't, you're not going to be sitting there worrying about whether or not it's totally accurate. So API. So meanwhile, though, it's an indicator and people do listen to it. So the API report was terrible. There was a 2.85 million barrel build in oil, a 4.6 million barrel build in gasoline and a 1.1 million build in distillates. And I said, that's like 10 million barrels a week too much oil according to API. That seemed excessive and unlikely to be repeated. So therefore, it was unlikely that anything that happened at 1030 in the EIA report was going to be bearish compared to the API, which already caused the sell-off. All right, so that was my logic for that. And it didn't take, so, so basically we picked up the gasoline. Look at this line, it's so beautiful, 166. We hit the 166 line on the nose. Spiked a little bit below, and now we're taking off. And he says, and is it 176? That chart's not updated. Oh, yeah, now it's blasting over 170. Oh, and the other thing is it's a holiday weekend. And we've been we've been wanting to play the holiday weekend long. Or we did, we have been playing the holiday weekend long, but we keep taking the profits and getting into it again. So now we got into it again. I sorry, I only got two contracts. I, I got two because I was hoping it would go back to 165, and then I had a couple more. I was hoping to see this, but it didn't work out. It just went straight up. So I only have two contracts. But still, two contracts, simple logic. All we're doing is reading the news, reacting to the news, making a logical conclusion. But two contracts, oh, see, now 170 should be the stop line. Um, two contracts makes 3,300 bucks in a day. I mean, it's good stuff. And all you got to do is pay attention. It's all it is. It's just a question of paying attention. Now, if the 170 line fails here, and it is a big run for the day, and it's failing right now. Wait, where is it? It's not failing right now. So it's almost failing. If the 170 line fails, I'd be more inclined to take it off the table. Certainly take one off the table because it's greedy. Um, I'd be more inclined to take it off the table. And, and in fact, I'm going to watch. One and I don't know about the second one. Oh, no, nah, I don't like the way it's going. All right, there. All right, so took it off the table. So now I've locked in my 3,300 for the day. If it goes back to 168, I'm going to be happy to buy again. I'll add one contract here, and then I'll add another one at 166, and I'll add two more at 165, and I'll be right back to where I was. But you have to recognize when you have a good run, and 170 is a really good run from 166, so when you have a four cent running gasoline, which is more than two and a half percent, you take it off the table. A two and a half percent move is huge. So we cash that in. You, I mean, look, I mean, look at this. This is just my little portfolio. And look at what we got here. We got one eighty five and one blah blah blah. It's like five thousand dollars for the day, just doing stupid little trades that were obvious. Um, where would you go along on Cisco after earnings? Where would I go long on Cisco? Did they have earnings? I, I didn't pay attention. I was Cisco. There's a lot of assumptions in a question like that. Um, 
Cisco, Cisco. Earnings are today. All right. So, thing number one, they're trading, you know, for Cisco. It's a it's a pretty high uh, multiple. I I don't hate it, but it's not it's high. Now, just because I see that though, I see the multiple in Yahoo. I mean, don't trust the multiples that you see. You got to verify it. So they're two hundred eight billion dollars. So are they dropping ten billion to the bottom line? That's what I expected. They're going to call it a twenty two multiple. So I look for the bottom line and I see, yep, ten billion dollars, no problem. All right. Now I'm going to look at now. I'm saying they're forty two dollars a share, and how much are they making per share? Two fifty per share. That's not bad. All right. So for two fifty, if it was twenty, see twenty times the the earnings per share, you're talking about fifty dollars. As far as what the actual cash is, they're they're showing um, ten billion dollars. So somewhere in the neighborhood of so somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty to twenty two times earnings is where we really are. Um, there's not a lot of growth here though. You're not buying you're not buying it for the growth. So if you're going to play it, I would play it conservatively. Um, it's all about just hoping they miss. Oh, see there, one seventy failed. See, I could tell it was looking ugly. Um, you know, if you're quick to take profits off the table, you will often regret that you took your profits off the table, but you will make money, <laughs> okay? If you're not quick to take your profits off the table, you might get lucky or you might lose money. I would prefer to always make money. This is Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett's number one rule of investing, and it's his only rule, is don't lose money. <laughs> And the way you don't lose money is by taking the profits when they're offered to you. Because like I said, even being cautious there, if I take a thousand here and a thousand there and a thousand there, and I do this every single day, I'm going to make a couple of hundred thousand, four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars a year. I don't need to have one big one that makes fifty thousand dollars. I just need to make a thousand here and a thousand there and five hundred here and five hundred there and I will, it'll add up. You got to have the discipline, though, to take the profits because these things, especially the futures, they will fly up and they will fly down and you'll be red and you'll be green. And if you can't learn to take the profit when they're green, you're, you're only going to take you only end up taking it when it's red. Because there is a point at which the pain of losing will cause you to close the position. And if there's no point at which winning is going to make you close the position, you're in trouble. And you know what? Your, lo your lost point. And your win point damn well better be the same. So if you say, I don't want to lose more than $1,000 on this position, well, then when you make 1000 you better take it the frick off the table. Because how ridiculous is that, that you have to win? Because you, otherwise you're saying, let's say you say, I want to make $2,000, but I'm only willing to lose 1000 If you say that, you have to consider that the only way you win is if it goes up twice as much as, as, as if uh, you lose. So you need, you need twice as big a move to, to, to take a win off the table than you do a loss. That makes no sense. Now, on the other hand, we use those tight stops on, on initial plays because sometimes we'll take a poke at a line. So let's say the 2600 line on the, on the, NAS, on the uh, s and we'll take a poke at 2600 and we're only going to lose 50 bucks or 100 bucks if we're wrong. But if we're right, we're going to let it run. But even so, if we're right and it doesn't look that strong and it's up 50 bucks or 100 bucks, we do take those off the table sometimes too because that pays for those losses. You can't always only play for a big winner. You know, and when you get a 500, if you have stop discipline at the bottom, if you have one $500 winner, it plays for 10 tries going the other way. So you have 10 chances to win. It's like getting free spins at the, uh, at the roulette wheel or the slot machine or whatever. And it is, it's a random thing. You, you know, no matter how smart you think you are, the futures at any given moment can go up and down the exact same amount for you or against you. So all we have to do is we use our logic and we try to have our timing. And if I read a news event, I say, has anybody reacted to this yet? And if they haven't, like the API stuff, was, there was an overreaction. And I said, the EI is going to come out. How could it be worse? How could it be worse than a 10 million barrel build in products? That makes no sense, and 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 lo and behold, it, well, it didn't happen. All right, so what am I doing? What were we looking at? I've totally lost track now. Cisco, right? <laughs> so Cisco, I look. I would just look at the earnings. I hope I hope they go lower. I hope they screw up. 
I love them long term. Uh, I, if they miss and it's not for some incredible reason would cause me to under, to revalue the company, I certainly would like to buy them at 35. So I would consider selling the 35 puts to be free money. Right? Because if they sell if I sell the 35 puts for three bucks, or it's 335 now. If I sell the 35 puts for 335, that that's me in below $32 a share. I would love to own Cisco for $32 a share. I'm not wild about them at 42, but at 32, I start to have like little hearts in my eyes. So that's a whole different ball game. Give me, give me, give me, give me a quarter off of where we are now, and I'm and I'm happy about the stock. I like the stock anyway. But I, I don't have a compelling reason to buy it. But if you tell me I can buy it for 32 bucks, yeah, I'll definitely buy it for 32 bucks. Okay, it's like the Levi's, right? If Levi's are 50 bucks in the store, I don't. I look at them. I'm like, well, I got like six in my closet. But if they're if they're 40 bucks or 30 bucks in the store, I'm gonna go. Well, I, I have six in my closet, but one's kind of wearing out, and another one I don't like so much. So for 30 bucks, I want to buy a pair for sure. It's the same pair. It's all about the price at the time. Versus how much do I need it? So I I have spaces in my portfolio. I'm going to fill them with something. And if I see Cisco at 42 bucks, yeah, you know, it's like, oh, there's, there's you know, 9,000 other stocks out there. But if I see Cisco for 32 bucks, I'm like, oh my God, Cisco's 32 bucks. I want that thing. So you have to have a value that you believe in for a price. So therefore, anyway, so that's my logic. So selling that for 335, that's a no brainer. Now, given that I have 335 to play with, I can now pick a 335 spread. Well, they're at 42. I don't really think they're going to go that much higher. So let's say if I sold the $45 calls for 445, I'm sorry, 450, whatever. So 450 plus the 335 I have in my pocket is eight bucks. That means I can afford to buy the 37s. So I can have the 3745. That's an eight dollar spread for net zero. Okay, so that spread is free. And if I want to pay a little bit more, and I would, I would get the uh, the 35s for nine something. So nine minus 450 is obviously 450 minus 335 is what a dollar 15. So for a dollar 15, I'm in the Cisco 35, um, whatever the hell I said, <laughs> the 3545 bull call spread. All right, so now I have for $1.50 and I've got the $10 bull call spread and all Cisco has to do is go to 45 and I'm gonna get paid back uh, 8.85 on my $1.15. That's it. That's how you make a spread that's gonna pay you back 600%. Not hard. <laughs> uh, let's see, May says, I have uh, uh, wheat and precious metal puts that are profitable. Should I close those out and roll them out into the 2020 wheat and precious metal puts? And what do you see as a good bottom for ABX? And I don't know. Oh, God. Really? <laughs> it's one thing. I mean. All right. <clears throat> May. All right. May has the wheat and precious metal puts that are profitable. Doesn't say what they are or what she paid for them or how much profit. Should I roll them out to the 2020s? Well, I have no idea. You have nine, you have these puts and you should you roll them out to 2020? All right, let's theoretically, if I sold the $20 wheat and precious metal puts in January for four dollars, now they're two fifty. I've made one fifty. And the question is, should I roll them out? Well, if I roll them out and give them another year, I only get another dollar. So if I don't do anything, I'm going to make 250 in a year. If I if I if I risk, don't forget you're giving them another year to beat you. If I risk giving them another year to beat me and give them a lower rate of decay, I only get a buck. So why would I do that? See, it's got to make sense. You have to think about the logic of what you're actually doing. It's like right now, these 250 puts to 20 to January 20s are decaying at a rate of 20 cents a month, basically. I'm not exact, but they're decaying at a rate of about 20 cents a month for 12 months, right? So every month, this guy's going to lose 20 cents. It doesn't matter what direction WPM goes. He's losing 20 cents a premium every month. It can't be stopped. That's out of the money premium. So if it goes up, it goes down. It doesn't matter. He's still losing the 20 cents. Then he gets paid the fair amount for the, for the puts at the end. This guy... 
for 360, it's not even 360, but let's say it was 360, he would be with 24 months to go, with twice the time to go, would be, um, you know, 15 cents or 10 cents. So his decay rate, which is the money you're guaranteed, you're guaranteed the decay on his premium. That's the only sure thing on the market is that his premium is going to go to zero. So, so you've now taken the, the thing that was making you 20 cents a month and turned it into something that makes you 10 cents a month. Why did you do that? Right? It doesn't make any sense. In fact, it makes more sense if you sold the 2020s to roll those to these because they have a much faster rate of decay. You're going to make twice as much money every month. It makes no sense not to. Where do I see a good bottom on ABX? I've seen a good bottom on ABX for the last $3. Um, so I wouldn't worry about it. So it's, uh, it, it just, you know, well, they have earnings tonight. So I, I figured if you wanted to do a roll, I would make sure you do your roll today because of earnings, it's becoming tough to get it, to get a good price. But I, I certainly like ABX. Also, May says, also, she's got more questions. I mean, how many of these are there? <laughs> um, Also, would like to know where your top target on Best Buy for 219 and 220. I have the 2020 1750 puts, and do you see Best Buy going to 15? And that concerns me as the 50 DMA is pointing blah, blah, blah on the daily chart. Oh, God. Okay. So let's take a look at Best Buy. Is that Best Buy or Bed Bath & Beyond? Bed Bath. I always mix those up. Um, BBBY. And she's looking at 50 day moving average in voodoo like that, which I'm not really a fan of. Wrong chart. Gallery view is the one I like. BBBY. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> so, what do you do? The, the 50 day is pointing down barely. Come on. I mean, the 200 is pointing down. I'd be a lot more concerned about that. But the 50 day is pointing down. That's just technical. Look, it's been it's been pointing down. That's why it's on sale. Look at this 200-day moving average. It's completely collapsing. So, so yeah, no surprise. The 50 days pointing. I mean, the 50 days barely pointing down. It's been doing okay. But the point is, I don't give a crap what the little squiggly lines are doing. I don't care what people think about the stock. I care what I think about the stock. So B B B Y. I can buy the company for three billion dollars, three point two billion dollars. When's their earnings? Oh, they had earnings already, so they've already had earnings. Um, and they make six hundred and eighty-five million dollars. So let's say they make about seven hundred million dollars. Now that was two. That's two seventeen. How have they been doing since? They oh no, they're not on pace for that though. Well, okay, this is a huge quarter. Okay, so we have this huge quarter. So let's see, they got uh, 100 and 150 is 240, and that, that's 500. They're really only on a pace of like $500 million. But you know what? $500 million, that's why they've gone down. They, 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 they are, they're, they're definitely getting their margins squeezed overall over time. Um, where's the annuals? Their business is still the same sales. Their margins are getting crushed, basically. I guess Amazon's probably hurting them and stuff like that. So same business, not as profitable, but it's not going to go that much lower than where it is now. They're holding this line of what they did last year. They're holding that line as far as profitability goes. $700 million, and I can buy the, they make, and I can buy the company for $3.2 billion. Now, let's see. Five times, five times. Seven hundred million dollars is three point five billion dollars. Five times earnings. So, do I want to buy Best Buy for three point two billion dollars if in year one I'm going to get back I'm going to get back more than twenty percent of my money? Yeah. Okay, a twenty percent return would be six hundred million dollars. This is more than that. This is $700 million. These guys are returning 20% of your cash. Where are you getting a better deal than this? What is it that you're going to do with your money that's going to get you better than 20% returns? If they go to 15, unless their earnings are drastically suffering, I want more. You're going to give me that stock for 15? How much would you like to sell me right now? You tell me. What do the analysts say? The analysts say 
that they go from 302 to 279. So they still think it's going to go down a bit, but not much. That's This is 18. So they think they're going to earn 3 bucks a share. And 3 bucks a share gives you a P of still 7. So, you know, and the analysts are assuming their business is, going to, is deteriorating on a steady pace, which I don't believe it is. I think it's flattened out already. Um, it remains to be seen. But meanwhile, nothing I would worry about. So you have the 1750 puts. I really don't think I'd worry about the 1750 puts. Um, that's not something I'd be concerned about, frankly. I, I, I think, what, what, do you, what do you get for those? Do we have this in our portfolio? Because if we don't, we should. Because, I, you know, here's the point. So for Best Buy, okay, I don't think it's going to go up. I don't think there's no particular reason for it to go up. But you can sell the 1750 puts for 230. I wouldn't do that. I would sell the 20 puts. I got balls. I'm going to sell it. I would sell the 20 puts for 350. And then you can buy the 15. No, well, let's see. No, how about the 1750s? The 1750s is seven, and the 25s. No, I, mean, I wouldn't even give them 25. Let's say the 2250s. So five dollar spread. These the the 2250s are 470. So what I say 470 and um, seven is 230. Jesus. Um, so it's only 230 for the five dollar spread. So 230 for the 1750 2250 spread. You sell the 20 dollar puts for 330, so you can buy twice as much as those. So you could buy ten thousand dollar spread for 430 minus 330 is a thousand bucks on a ten thousand dollar spread. And then so sell five of the twenty dollar puts for uh, 15. I guess to be round, I'm just using three three dollars for 1500 bucks. And you buy ten of the of the seven dollar. You buy ten of these for seven thousand, and you sell ten of these twenty two fifties for um, oh five thousand, whatever. You know, you get the point. So it's going to be so that's two thousand. So you know, so so basically, you're in you're in a, you're in the spread. You're doing twenty of them. So it wouldn't be five thousand. Be ten that it would be. Damn it! If you do twenty, it's fourteen thousand minus. 9,000, roughly, not 9,000, sorry, 10,000. So you're in for $4,000, less 10 of these that you sell for uh, for 35. Yeah, it's nothing. It's like 1,000 bucks. You're on 1,000 bucks for a $10,000 spread. So 20 of the 1750, 2250 uh, bull call spreads and sell 10 of the $20 puts. And now you have a 900% upside if they hold if they hold $20. All they have to do is all they have to do is not drop 10% in two years, and you're gonna and you're gonna make ten thousand dollars. I mean, come on, guys, it's not hard to make some money. It's just you gotta have a you gotta have a premise. You have to have a little bit of faith in some companies that aren't that like everything doesn't go to zero. And it's great. You find these ones that are out of favor like this, and you make a play. I'm gonna add that to the uh to the OOP. It's a great play. I mean, that's exactly what we like in the OOP. We don't have to make a huge commitment, but we can make a ton of money. Can you put a stop loss on the futures contracts so you have to keep watching your position? You can't. The problem with the futures stop loss is, in other words, I could have a position um, on the futures active trader. Okay. All right. Uh, how, much it, how much will it cost me to, to show you this? Um, let me let me first of all let me be a little bit responsible. Okay, I want to just see if I want to see if there's reason to, to actually do this right now. Okay, do any of these guys look like they're hitting a wall? There's no really good number here to to hit the short on. Um, but let, let's let's take the Dow for a second just to show you. So it's not that expensive. I can show you. So I, let's take the short the Dow here. Oh, <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> come on. Come back, come back, come back, come back. Oh, this is so unfair. All right, here we go. All right, I'll take that. All right, so I'm going to short the Dow at 2, 4, blah, 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 whatever. Now, 
I can put a I can put a a, a buy here. That becomes my well. It's not even executing. So I can put a buy in here. See that buy? That's my stop loss. It says one stop right there. Okay. So that becomes my stop loss. The problem is in the futures if it gaps past it it'll never execute that position and that buy will hang there even though it goes flying higher because yeah, i have a buy-in for this exact price i don't have a buy-in limit sell or anything like that futures contracts don't generally work that way oh. Meanwhile, I, took a, I just took a $25 loss to, to show you that. But you see, that executed. So if you stick with the indexes, you'll usually get an execution, but sometimes things will gap right past you. And also, by the way, when you put in an order, they can see it, and they'll flush your stop. So they just stole that money from me while I was talking to you. Because the fact that I had that there meant that somebody, the, some of the floor traders could sit there and say, oh, okay, I can, I can, what I do, I sold first. They're saying I can buy this from this guy for this price. We can then push the Dow up a little bit, and I can then take his stop loss out. And I'm gonna make. That's what they're saying. They just made it to put 25 bucks. They're like, that was easy. The guy just handed it to me because I put it in a stop loss near the place where I had it. You shouldn't. You shouldn't do it. You gotta watch it. They are. They literally have algorithms that can see exactly what you're doing, and they are thrilled to make five dollars. They because they make five dollars a hundred million times a day. They do not care how little the money is. If you give them a chance to steal money from you, they will take every penny you offer them. All right, so now we're high, so I'm going to take this trade more serious. I, my, I really want to see if we can short a 24.8. That's a good spot to short. Because you figure there's going to be some kind of pullback at some point, but maybe not. You know, not the way this is going so far. So meanwhile, I took it. So I took a quick loss. So now let's turn to that example. I took a quick loss because my premise didn't work out. Now I want to establish a position below 24.8. So I'm willing to take one here, which is quite a bit higher than one. And I see as soon as I did that, it popped up. But I, I don't care because I plan to scale into the position. So now I'm going to take another one at 95. That brings my average up. I don't, I don't know. Oh, here it is. It brings my average up to 89. And now if we hit 24.8 and I do two more, which it won't execute there, though I have to do it here. I do two more. Now my average is going to be 95. Oh, there it goes. Now my average is oh, 94. But now, ah, come on, went over. So now what I want to do is I want to sell to at 94 because now I would be in two at 27.94. That's my average. So I've got, I don't really want four contracts. I want two contracts, but I wanted to raise my strike. Now. Now that I have 494, if I want to raise my contract price, which I don't, there's no point. Because if it's over, my premise is blown. But if I wanted to raise my price, I'd want to be at least 10 higher than 94, which would be 04. And if I sold four more there, it would bring that up five. And I'd be right about, I would be right about at 24,799. But I don't want to do that. I say if this is wrong, it's going to go badly wrong. I figured 1520 over here is going to be something that's going to get rejected. And remember I said it can go 10 higher. That's exactly 10 higher now than what we said before. These guys are off into space. This guy's off the charts. Look at that. The NASDAQ is off the charts. I think this has really got to pull back a little bit. Oh, 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 shit. So you just made the money. So now what I says, so remember what I did? So now, so now I hit what, so even though I started down here at 80 something, I added here, raised, I raised, yes, I raised my basis because I'm shorting. I raised my basis, and now my basis is the 24,799 that I wanted it to be. Because what I did is I, I bought, I, I'm sorry, so I, I sold two here. I sold two more when it got closer. That brought my average up to here. And now that I took my profit on those two, I have a higher basis. So probably my real basis is right about here. It's hard to tell because it's messy because I had things before. So now I have two short though, which is what I wanted to do with that spot. So you got to use this little elevator to to, and you've got to, but you've got to do the math. You've got to say, okay, if I, you know, if I start off, do I have a clean one? I have a clean one, but the S and P doesn't have a thing. Um, 
Yeah, it doesn't have the uh, it doesn't have these bar. I don't know why either. It's, for some reason, the S and P and the and the Nasdaq don't do these uh, these little boxes, which I love. These little boxes. It makes it so much easier to see what's going on. It's very annoying. I don't I don't know why. I'm not sure what can happen. Anyway, so if you if I start here, let, let's just do it as an example because I think they're all going to go down. So we're going to short one here. 2693. That filled very easily, which makes me nervous. If you get an easy fill, it means something's wrong. <laughs> anyway, so that's 2693. I would have rather been short at 2695, but we're not at 2695, and I think it's going lower. So I'm going to wait. But now, what's my plan? So at 2693, if it gets to 2695, I would add another short. What would that do? That would give me two short at 2694 average. It would raise this and lower this, right? So my average would be 26.94. Then if I get out, then if we come back, don't forget I'm doing that at 26.95. Then if we come back to 26.94, I get out of one. Now I've got one short of 26.94, which is closer to my goal, even though I started at 26.93. So you have to learn how to do that. I, I would strongly recommend doing this on a paper trading account, not just handing people 25 bucks like I did before. Um, but I would recommend going on a paper trading account and playing with these things because you can play with it all day long. You know, but do it with money that doesn't count. Don't do it with money that does count because that's crazy. Um, but you can see how you can adjust your trades along the way and you can practice because the practice is key. It's getting the hang of it and getting the feel of the swing and how it moves back and forth. I saw in uh, Wall Street that Good Valley Francisco is about 33. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, you know, it's not so bad. Um, you had missed you had the adjustments in the OOP, which I missed for WPM. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. Well, I did fine though. It's a great stock. Don't worry about it. It's just it's only down because silver was down. Uh May says, okay, what I want to know is whether to keep my 219 put spreads. Uh thanks, I won't roll them then. Yeah, it's fine. It's gonna go good. Um it, and again, it's a decay thing. You have to you, you always have to look at the relative value of, of what you're doing. You know, what's your goal? Your goal is for this guy to lose all his money, right? So how, what's the fastest, best way for him to lose all his money? Because you're not changing your target. It's the same target. You're just you're just giving. And, and when you give it another year, you're giving him another year to go against you. If it's going to go your way, it doesn't matter if it's 2020 or 2019 because it's already at that level. But if it's going to go against you, you don't want to give him another year. We have Best Buy in the OLP. Oh, okay. I would like to roll my Best Buy 219 into Best Buy 1750 puts. Well, you can, sure. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, have you adjusted the February short 257 puts? If not, any thoughts? Oh, that, that good time to do that. Good timing by Brendan. Oh, I like Brendan. He's a good guy. All right, let's take a look at the portfolio. It's going to board with staring at the speed. Oh, wait. <laughs> I've got money on this. Though. All right, sorry, Cisco. This didn't move, so I'm going to... See if I can get out even. Can I buy that back? Nobody's going to give it to me. Oh, there it goes. So you got out of that even. And I'll take a quick profit here because I don't really feel like losing money since I had such a good day. One and two. Oh, no, I went the wrong way. Ah! <laughs> I did the wrong side. See, that's another thing you got to learn not to do. My bad. Come on back. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, there you go. So that one filled, even though I was like way below where the thing was, it filled. That was weird. Very annoying. How are we looking? He's not going to make 20. I'm pretty confident in this thing. But I would like to have two, not three. <sighs> okay, good. Now I have two. All right, I'll leave two, thanks to fate, <laughs> and we'll move on. All right, where were we? Portfolios. What was the question? I forgot. Um, February 287 puts, 257 puts. Okay, that was in the short-term portfolio. 
So how are we doing? The options opportunity portfolio, flat. Yeah. You know what? Considering all the turmoil, that's not bad. I'm not too happy. I'm not upset about that. Butterfly portfolio, down 3%. That doesn't really matter on the butterfly portfolio. Um, all that matters in the butterfly portfolio is if you're on track or off track. So we sold the 23, no, no, no. We sold the 2930 puts and calls. And we are off track because we're at 25 now. So OIH had a big pullback. Now, meanwhile, that means OIH might get interested for our long-term portfolio. OIH. Because five bucks is a nice is a nice move down. Wow. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Hmm. We might adjust this to a bigger position. This is a this is a much better position for OIH for us. This is worth taking. This is oil services. It's an ETF. It's it's not likely to go way down from there. See, so look, it bottomed out at 20. And we and, and when we have a two-year position, we don't care if it bottoms out at 20. We don't leave them. We don't we don't care if it goes from 25 to 20. That's not a hassle for us because we're selling much more premium than that. So this is nice. I'm happy about this. This is the perfect price for OIH. Um anyway, all right. So in the in that, so somebody remind me about that in chat. Uh let's see, the long-term portfolio is probably doing good. Three points, look at that. Three point three percent. That's freaking amazing, considering. Like we started buying and the market crashed. So I'm really happy about that. There's a lot of positions already. I mean, <laughs> we had a lot of stuff. We just took advantage. That's why I have all, of all the stuff that went down. Uh, the money tour portfolio, oh, 73%. Unbelievable. It's actually, it's, it's back to where it was when I was on the show, which was what, the beginning of the month. So basically we didn't lose any money. We did, we, it's been flat through all this turmoil and stuff and the market being down 5%, this thing's still flat. So happy about that. The OOP, oh, we said that already, that's flat. But we have a lot of positions and we've also pushed up. We've got a couple of big, <clears throat> where did we get slammed in the OOP? Um, Not our hedges. Our hedges are flat. Did I suddenly go? Did it suddenly go blank? What? When did that happen? Wow. Okay. Sorry. I have no idea what happened. All of a sudden, I was talking and talking and talking. Brilliant stuff, by the way. Brilliant. I mean, unfreaking believable. The explanation was incredible. I, the strategies were incredible. It was some of the best stuff I've ever done. I, I, don't, I have no idea where you guys lost me. Ten minutes ago. Wow. Crazy. Wow. Oh, that sucks. I was. I was really getting into like a detailed explanation of, of God knows what. Um, the portfolios, that's what we were doing. Did you guys start seeing me do portfolios? That's what I did. I started talking about the positions and explaining the strategies. Well, that's weird. I don't think I hit anything. I don't know what happened. I mean, I have the, the panel for the, for the sh shutting down is even open. Hmm. All right. So you saw me do portfolios, yes? Does anyone know what portfolio I left off on? LTP, thank you. Okay, fantastic. Let's pick it up in the LTP then. Good job. All right. So long-term portfolio. Is that, the, is that the last one? Oh, that's the first one. Oh, my God. So you're telling me I only went to the butterfly? Is that what you're saying? We only did the butterfly, and now we we're going to do the long-term portfolio? Ugh. All right. Let's try this again. Good God. I got to go four hours on Sunday. <laughs> All right. Sunday I'm, doing, Sunday I'm doing a live thing. I got a four hour webinar. All right. So 
Hang on, let me shut that down. I'll start talking about this then. All right. Alex, stop ringing. Why is it ringing? It shouldn't even be able to ring. Unbelievable. All right. So long-term portfolio. We're up 3.3%, which is really good considering how like volatile the market's been. Don't forget, we sell a lot of premium. So when the market gets volatile, it goes against us because all the premium we sold gets more expensive. So whether we're right or wrong in our direction, the short premium that we sell goes against us and costs us a lot of money. So that, that can cause some very violent fluctuations in our profitability. But meanwhile, this is fine. Being up 3.3% a month into this thing, I mean, that's, that's a 30, 40% a year rate anyway, so it doesn't matter. But, you know, we, we, we are actually, we will probably leap ahead of this. As the markets stay at this level and stay high, we will probably leap ahead of this uh, moving forward. We have a lot of positions. That's unfortunate because it makes it really a pain in the ass for me to do my reviews. Um, I was so happy when we shut down and went to cash and I didn't have these big reviews to do. And all of a sudden, I'm back with 30 freaking positions. I mean, that's uh, it's my, it's my fault. <laughs> it's not it's not anyone else's fault. It's my fault because I had so many positions so quickly. But there were so many there were so many things to buy. There's a lot of good opportunities. Uh, and you guys don't want to make no money. You want to see some money get made. So let's do that. All right, so that's the long-term portfolio. The long-term portfolio is covered by the short-term portfolio, which itself is up. Now that's now the short-term portfolio is supposed to be a hedge, so it's supposed to actually lose money when the long-term portfolio, portfolio makes money. The short-term portfolio is $100,000. The long-term portfolio is $500,000. So if the short-term portfolio is down 10%, the long-term portfolio is up 10%, that means the long-term portfolio is up 20,000 and the short-term is up 10. I'm sorry. The long-term would be up $50,000 if it's up 10% and the short-term would be down $10,000. And that's fine. That's what you expect out of your hedges. You know, you're gonna give up a certain percentage, like a quarter maybe of your money gets given up in the hedges, but that's not what's happening here. Now, somebody had asked about the 257 February puts. It's not a big deal because we're either going to roll them out to another month, but we don't have to because we sold them for 858 and they're now 945. So essentially it's a $3,000 loss because there's 40 of them, but essentially we're only losing like not even a dollar on these hedges. So we're, ju we're just going to basically shut these down and then sell something else strategically next month. This month, we didn't make any money on our short on our short puts. Maybe a month, maybe next time, we will make money on the short puts. But they're only there to insure us against the, the reason we have these short puts is so that if the market doesn't go down, we collect a decent amount of money from our longs. Now, what happened is, don't forget, we already collected uh, on our original DIA puts. Which is why we're actually not, in fact, thanks to that, we're not losing money because we would have been losing money from these stupid things, from these short SVXYs. But we, we made so much, we made money on the DIAs and we made money on the other on the other short DX, SVXYs we, that we sold. These guys are, are just dead. We're going to, well, these are February, so these are going to be, unfortunately, we're going to have to pay that back. And these long-term ones, I'm willing to hold on to them. I mean, I, I mean, obviously they're they're massively out of the money. We're not going to get it back, but maybe we get to 25 and we pick up another uh, 25 thousand dollars. I wouldn't mind that. So, so you know, I think we'll take a look and see. It can't get much worse. It's a 12. How much lower can it go? So that's our short-term portfolio, and our um, the other nice thing about the short-term portfolio, of course, is we sell these short puts as offsets, and when they start to recover, we've got. Um, uh, how much is that? That's uh, ten and twenty and almost thirty thousand dollars of short puts here. So it's only a hundred thousand dollar portfolio. We have thirty thousand dollars worth of short puts. So if the market goes up and our hedges don't pay off, we're going to get thirty thousand dollars back on the short puts. I mean, assuming obviously they don't go down against the market. How is Chimera? Mm, they just had nice earnings. I can't believe they're still down that low. All right, so that's the short-term portfolio. The money talk portfolio, that's a self-hedging portfolio. That's back up to exactly where, it's, it's basically exactly where it was when I was on TV at the beginning of the month. So no change. Now, we did make changes. We added GE, which is a disaster. We added ABX, which is a disaster. But we had these hedges, which paid us uh, $5,000. <coughs> so 
So that's that's what saved it. So in other words, we had we had bad bad positions in GE and ABX. Um, IMAX is in great shape. LB is in great shape. Uh, Wheat and Precious Metals is in great shape, and Apple. And this portfolio, by the way, is on track to make another like thirty, forty thousand dollars this year. It's only a fifty thousand dollar portfolio when it started, so it's going to make. We, we expect to make sixty to eighty percent this year on the on this portfolio from the original fifty thousand dollars. So it's a great solid portfolio that is now officially uh, market proof. I mean, it's been tested, it's been battle tested, and it came back uh, basically the same places where it started the month. So we didn't make money this month, but not losing money on, on a five percent market drop is fantastic. Um, then we've got the uh, oh, there's only one more. Then we got the options opportunity portfolio. That unfortunately has gone flat. We were up four thousand dollars at some point, but that's gone. Um, the reason for that is we have some big losers. We have, um, well, this TZA is actually the remainder of a TZA spread, so that doesn't really count as a loss. Um, but we have, we have this TZA spread. Oh, no, it's not, wait, wait, wait. No, I'm sorry. No, we didn't do that in here. This TZA spread, yeah, we have the um, $15 calls in January, but we sold um, we sold, we, we bought, we, oh, I'm sorry, we have the, we have the 1520 spread. That's what we have. We have the 1520 spread in January. There's four parts to this thing. <clears throat> so that's our main hedge. We sold the April because we, we cashed out a successful part of the spread already. It was different. We, so, we, we sold the April 15 calls. Now, TZA is at 12. It spiked up to 15, but it didn't hold it. I'm pretty confident in these. So we're going to collect this 1200 bucks. Also, we sold the July 12 calls, and TZA is at 12 now. Now, if TZA stays at this level, if the Russell stays at this level, and TZA doesn't go much higher than where it is now, this thing is going to pay us. It's going to pay us nine thousand dollars. These short July calls. So you know, all all we have to do is have the market stay flat. We're going to pick up nine thousand dollars here, which is which is ten percent of this portfolio. And that more than pays for what we would lose on these uh, hedges. See this hedge from the 15 to 20? It's only $3,000. So we're going to make nine. If it, you know, if this doesn't pay off, we'll make nine. If this does pay off, we're going to collect uh, $25,000. So if the market goes up, we get $9,000. If the market goes down, we get $25,000. And uh, then we got wheat and precious metal. Who else is a big loser here? So, so that's a loser, but it's not really. That's the thing. You always got to look at option positions. Not so much are they winning or losing now. Are they on track? Are they doing what you want them to do? That matters a lot more than whether it's winning or losing at any given moment. That's kind of a random thing. Northern Dynasty. We uh, recently added to that and doubled down on it. I guess it's at uh, 111 now. That's very speculative and long term, so we'll see what happens. But that's down a lot right now, four thousand um, bucks. GE also terrible, another four or five thousand dollars down on GE, and we we are waiting for them to come back. Uh, who else is bad? CHK is bad, and they're down. I think they have earnings tonight. Do they? I, I think they have earnings today. Um, they're at four, they're at three, and we have the three five spread. It wasn't worth adjusting. We looked at it recently. There's nothing worth adjusting. It's just basically sit here and, and wait and see if they recover or not. That's all that you can do with that one. Um, and that's it. Nothing else is really terrible. Oh wait, wait, wait. Oh no, this isn't. See, there's no, and this 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 SQQ hedge. We lost eight thousand here. We made eight thousand there. Who cares? But important point here. This is a twenty thirty spread in January. We have to sell some calls against it. We can't just sit on that because we paid five thousand dollars for that spread. So we want to really collect about a thousand bucks a month in short calls against this position, so we can pay off what we spent what we spent on the spread. After we collect five, after we collect a thousand, after we collect five thousand dollars we paid for it, it's a free hedge. What do we care? And again, this spread is a cover because we already cashed out a profitable uh, profitable spread from it. So there you go. The portfolios are in very good shape. I mean, considering the correction this month, um, it's in very good shape. And I'm going to go over in the next two days, you guys are going to get a bunch of like notes out on all of our adjustments and all the positions. All right. So 
Uh, we're going to have to wrap this up shortly, so let's just get to a thing. Uh, ABX. Let's see. <clears throat> All right, so Molly says, sorry, I lost the connection. I have a question about ABX. I accidentally sold one $10 2020 call against my $10 2020 longs. What? I'm down 38 since ABX is reporting today. I'd like to know what my options are. Let me get this straight. You sold a 2020 call against your 2020. What? How could you? <clears throat> I'm confused. I mean, if you if you if you own five 2020 longs. Oh, so there's a difference in pricing on the twos. All right. Well, either way, look. All you, all you can do is buy back the one you don't believe in. And, I, and again, you're not you're not talking numbers or anything else, so I'm not sure what's going on there. But it says you accidentally sold a $10 2020 call. Are you talking about a strike, though? Not the price you paid. You're talking about a strike. You understand? It's like you, what you want to say is I have five... 2020 $10 calls and I sold five $13 calls, something like that. I don't know, something specific that I can look at. You sold one $13 2020 call against your, I don't know how many 2020 $10 calls. So what's the big deal? You're down 38 bucks. You only have one? I, 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 <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a really hard time like figuring out how to, you know, what you're even asking. So if you own the 2020 $10 calls and you sold the $13 calls, even if you have one contract of each, the one contract of the $10 calls, yes. All right. So you have a 1013 spread. And 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 the and and, and here in real life, the uh, the 2020 10s on ABX. A B bah, A B X. The 2020 $10 calls are five bucks basically and the thirteen dollar calls are three thirty yeah we all did brandon sorry sorry brandon we all got disconnected if something went wrong um all right well let me finish up this one all right so if you're in the spread for net two which is roughly where it is you know so if you're in the spread for net two that's two hundred dollars for the spread okay if ABX is over 13 in 2020, you will get back $300 because it's a $3 spread. So the most you can make is 50%, assuming you're in for two and it's $3 spread. The most you can make is 50%. What, it's, what it says now is irrelevant. If it says you're down 38, the reason it says you're down 38 is because when your broker calculates how much your thing is worth, they say that it's worth the bid which is 490 and that you'd have to buy back for the S, which is 355. So you're on it. You see how big of a difference that is? Because the last price is a 510 and 3, 328. So they're going to hit you for $30 here and they're going to hit you for um, probably that one might be right. So you're basically, they'd be hitting you for like 30 bucks right here on the balance sheet. You can't use the balance of your broker as your decision making process. You've got to make your own decisions and decide if you're on track or off track. And do you feel comfortable having the 1013 spread for two? Do you want to have the 1013 spread for two dollars that you that you can make three dollars back on? If you if you do, if you like that position, if you want that position, if the time frame works for you, then leave it alone. If you buy it back, understand though, if you buy it back, now you're risking um five dollars on the ten dollar calls and you've got to be over 15 to just get your money back so i would not i would not do it without the spread i wouldn't i wouldn't be in a position like that without the spread 
All right, now back to Brendan. DIA. What I said about the DIA, is I guess they're just coming back in the portfolio, is that we sold those guys for 850, and now they're like nine something. So uh, essentially, we're just going to close it and take the loss, which is about three thousand dollars, and then we're going to sell ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars worth of puts next month. We only have to be lucky once, right? If we, if, if, if every month we're unlucky, like we are this month, because we had a sharp drop. If every month we're unlucky and we lose three thousand dollars. Compared to one month, we're lucky and make fifteen thousand dollars. We only have to be lucky once in a while. So this is all just part of the process. Okay, there's going to be twelve sales like this over the course of the year or, or whatever. Um, it's just a question of sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't work. The butterfly portfolio is a great example of that. When we do the butterfly portfolio, it's all about you win some, you lose some. But over the over the you know it, it's being the house. It's a whole concept of being the house. We're like sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. But you know what? We win more than we lose, and it adds up after time. Yeah. Okay. No, I get it. You have the one ten thirteen spread. I should if I I should have executed the one ten twenty spread by accident. You sold the thirteen. It's no big deal. So you have the 1013 spread. It's, it's going to make 50% in two years. It's going to make 25% a year. It's not a terrible spread. So if you wanted to have the 1020 spread, you could always roll the 13s up to the 20s. I think that's being very ambitious, though. Because you need the stock to go up 50% to make your money. I think, I think frankly, I'd rather have um, two of the 1015 spreads. Or... Yeah, no, that's the way I go. The tens are five bucks. The fifteens are two fifty. They're going to make a hundred, so that's going to make a hundred percent. That's less than two fifty for that spread. And um, if I bought two of those, or whatever, the the point being, every 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 hundred you spend there is going to is going to give you back two hundred instead. So it's a better spread than the uh, thirteen than the ten thirteen. And I, and I have just, I think ABX is just as likely to be at 15 and this is 13. So I think that's not really a stretch. 20, though, you're starting to really stretch it. So, okay, so hopefully you're all fixed and he's all fixed and everybody's happy. How are the indexes doing? Let's take a look. Ooh, very strong stuff. Look at the desk. Just stuck. See, it's still stuck in the same place. Very short. All these looks oh this is horrifying. Look at it. 1520. He stopped at 1520 like we thought. Or no, no, wait, 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 wait. 15, 1480, 15, 1510. Did he actually go up 10 more points? I forgot where we were now. This is hard. Wow. We're back to this scary, crazy stuff. And look at the NASDAQ with the 666. They love that. They love closing at 666. If you don't think the market is manipulated, how come 666 comes up so much? It's not an accident, and it's not because say, oh wow, look at RB. It's not because Satan is actually involved. Oh, did I leave one long? And I take it off. I took it off. Ah, oh, I took that last one off, didn't I? RB, I did. Woe is me. I only made three thousand dollars. I could have made five. All right. Anyway, now I'm depressed. Um. Oh, no, but my natural gases are probably doing good. Let's see. NGB8. Eh, not so good yet. Got four long. These are uh, October natural gas contracts. I expect to get back to three at some point, but that's a long, long trip for that. That's why they are Octobers. Wow, RB really shot up, though. I don't even want to look. Yes, I got. I forgot I got out of that. I thought I left one in. So here we go. We're going for 666 for the close on the NASDAQ. Still got a long time for the close of another hour. The Dow struggling at 24.8. And we're blasting over all of our lines. This is, this is a very, now we're into like a very strong recovery. We're probably going to just keep going up. So <clears throat> I'm going to do the portfolio adjustments tomorrow and Friday. Um, I, you know, it's hard, like like with that short 257, we can make a lot of money. If the Dow goes up another 500 points, we can make a ton of money on those short 257 puts. So I'm not really inclined to run out of them until we see the market like breaking down. 
but I hate to do adjustments where I give complicated instructions like if this happens, then do this, and if that happens, then do that. So I, I prefer to just make a call. So we'll we'll just have to see what happens tomorrow as the thing times out. But if we hold these levels, because we're well over the, the strong bounce lines now, if we hold these levels through the close, and if we hold them all all day, they can't ever break. If we hold all those strong lines tomorrow, then we absolutely um, then we're going to be back in a bullish path. We're going to be back in this the, the same scary bullish path that we were that we wanted to short last time. Except this time, after having a pullback and um, dropping like that, I don't think we're going to want to be as inclined to be short. So we're going to have a different attitude about it because we're going to be very, very cautious in our hedging because um, this is a super strong market. I mean, it goes 10% and bounces back 10%. That's crazy. And as it is now, we've, we've already taken back about half of what we lost. Let's take a look at some of those charts. We'll finish up with that. I mean, this is incredible recovery considering and, and, but, and, and undeserved. I mean, we're, we're still so overboard. But what can you do? I mean, what are you, you going to do? That's the way the market's running. So not not quite half yet, but we're getting there. This is so twenty six five to twenty four, two and a half thousand points. So that means twelve fifty is five two fifty right here. See where that spike was? That's going to be the that's the recover that's that's going to be the fifty cent recovery if we get that far. Right now though, we're just at the strong bounce lines. These are all strong bounces. He's over the strong bounce. Everybody else is right at their strong bounce lines basically. If we hold the strong bounce lines for one full day. So from this closing until the next closing, then we are officially back to being bullish. And then we'll see how high it goes. The next resistance will be at those 50% lines. And if we get those 50% lines, we are going all the way to retest the highs probably. Where we're, I'm going to be extremely tempted to short again, frankly. But for now, we have to play it like uh, effectively just be bear, bullish and ride the wave. But we know when to get out. If the strong lines fail at any time, the strong lines fail, we're, that's a problem. It's actually more of a problem now that we've tested them. Because now that we've tested them, see here we are? See that? See how we're at these lines here? So these same lines that we tested on the way up, basically, not there, but these there. So these same lines we tested on the way up, we're testing on the way down, coming back, and if we hold them, and move up from there, that could be very good. But if we then if we then come back, whether we test the top or not, if we come back and fail the next time, that's a bad sign. That means that we're probably gonna find a new floor below where we are here. But but until that happens, until we cross back below these lines, we're effectively long. So we could actually go long here. Who's the best long on the indexes? Here you go. S&P 2700, we can play that long. We can play uh, the Dow, uh, I don't like playing the Dow 24, eight long. 1520 on the Russell, if you're over 1520 on the Russell, over 2700 on the S&P, over 248 on the uh, Dow, and over 6650 on the NASDAQ. If all four of those are over, just play the one that's lagging, and then you don't have to get at, you really just use those lines for a stop. If any of them go below, you stop out. And that's it. So now we're going to have to sit back and see what happens. But meanwhile, I mean, you know, like, like I said, today, just doing some quick trades, I made mean, $5,000. So we just have to watch to use those lines as resistance points. And that's what we can base our futures trades out of. So we can do, you know, we've been doing this every day. We've been crushing it on the futures. All right. And, and that's about it. So I have to cut this thing out now. And um, we'll do it again next week. But, oh, so one more webinar. We're going to do a regular webinar Wednesday. Saturday, not Saturday, sorry, Sunday, the 25th, I'll be in New York at the Marriott Marquis uh, for the Traders Expo, 9 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. Um, and I'm going to do a four-hour, that's twice as long as these things, do a four-hour uh, webinar with, uh, I'll be standing there with my screens and my PowerPoints and all kinds of fun stuff. So if you guys want to come, I think it's 200 bucks, and it will be at the Traders Expo, and there's a there's a link on our main page for that. So if anybody wants to see me actually live, that's my next show. <laughs> all right, guys. So otherwise, I'll see you all next week. But thanks for coming. All right, take care.